Um, yes. Uh, so, yeah, welcome everyone to our first lens uh, with a Z. And the reason uh, we called it lens is because uh, we look at things through interdisciplinary lenses with different part with different pairs of glasses. And uh, we wanted to zoom into certain aspects of the pandemic. Um, and uh, we do this by Zoom, and so that's why we called it Lens. Um, this is our first Lens seminar, and our, our, our Lens seminars come actually from you, because they come from the declarations of interests that you have shown us to uh, the great enthusiasm that a lot of you have shown for our seminars and for our interdisciplinary work. And um, so these seminars are actually for you and uh, that's why we keep them short and we keep them simple. And this is the longest introduction you're gonna get. Um, I have decided to start the seminar series in a very awkward way uh, by asking uh, Dr. Sara Nielli, who is uh, a classics graduate who works at our center. She has a PhD from UF. Um, and uh, because One Health at UF is a truly interdisciplinary center. So it's not surgeons talking with clinicians, it's not even uh, biomedical doctors who, who cure animals, who speak to doctors, who cure people, who, who cure children. We actually do what we actually strive to bring in other disciplines because we think that we can look at health in a healthier way, in a more integrated way, in a more educated way, because there is a pre-pandemic way of, looking health and there's a post-pandemic way of looking health and this for us I think and for the One Health community is a is a great opportunity and so um, I would like to uh, thank uh, Sara Nieli uh, um, for willing to be our first speaker and for um, talking to us about contagious words and how words have shaped the pandemic and of how words that are so important in uh, communicating our feelings, in communicating uh, our actions, in communicating our thoughts uh, can at times be misleading or uh, misunderstood or uh, actually mean something completely different from what you had imagined. So, um, or can be new. I think that we have certainly learned a lot of new words and, and we are here to share this experience. So uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, thank you, Sara, again. And um, I look forward to a, a very uh, vivacious and uh, interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kappa. Thank you, Costanza, for, yeah, for giving me the opportunity to talk about this uh, other aspect of COVID-19 pandemic. Can you, can you see my screen well? I think so. Yes. yes. So, thank you. So I would like to start by saying that uh, great social change brings great uh, uh, linguistic change. And it's never been truer than uh, like this current uh, uh, global crisis. Uh, so we, since uh, the, the end of January, beginning of February, we have always experiencing a rare phenomenon. And I'm talking about the rise of the usage of a, of a word uh, that has dominated the global discourse. And I quote here in this first slide uh, um, something said by the Oxford English Dictionary editorial team in one of their blog, uh, blog back in April. Before 2020, coronavirus was relatively rare outside medical and scientific discourse, while COVID-19 was only coined in February. Both now dominate global discourse. And in this next slide, I actually, I actually added a chart where you can see how the usage of COVID rapidly changed from uh, the appearance of COVID, uh, as far as we know, in December to March. And it dominated over other topics as Brexit, uh, back then impeachment, or like climate change. 
So I know that I have an hour, I will try to keep it shorter, but I decided to divide my talk in three parts, touching different aspects of the COVID-19 language. And the very first part, I wanted to talk about the linguistic change, the, the language development that we have been all experiencing during the pandemic. Then the second part, I will discuss the corona, how the coronavirus disease and, uh, um, and uh, like the virus and the disease were, were named, where were were did they get their official name? And I will address this question. Is uh, the language of COVID-19 in English? In the very last part, I will actually discuss about our, I will present our initiative, Contagious Words, and I would like just to share with you some, uh, some sources that I found very valuable if you wanted to learn more about COVID, uh, the, the language of COVID-19. So let's start about the, the linguistic change, the language development. Um, so like we know that the COVID-19 pandemic uh, led to a new vocabulary and part of this vocabulary is characterized by new lexical formation. And I just added some. If you Google new words COVID, you find plenty. I just learned about mask knee, for example, that it was out like two days ago, but has been used since June. I found an article from the New York Times. And it's a, a term that like to refer like the acne that you get wearing the mask all day or blurs day, like we all have experience in working from home, we kind of like lost track of time and we, we get confused which days. Uh, but these are just like few example of new terms that have been part of, the, of, the lang of our uh, daily language. Uh, something else that happened, there are other terms that have been out there for many years. Some of them actually centuries, like think about like pandemic, quarantine, virus, all these words have been there before, so they are not new formation, but we have been using in a different way and we tweak their meaning according to what we are experiencing. And uh, yeah, and, uh, in, in order to track the development uh, of, of the language, I've been relying uh, on uh, the Oxford English Dictionary Lexicographer, but they have been describing this change within the language since the very beginning. Uh, and I realized that it's, I mean, it's the most valuable source, it's the one that is most quoted. So most of my references come from there. And uh, like among, uh, uh, among those words that were, uh, were existing before, but we now, are, like they are now part of our vocabulary, are self-isolation and uh, its verb, to self-isolate. So both those words uh, date from the 19th century. But back in the 1800s, we used to indicate the attitude of countries to um, isolate themselves politically and economically, rather than indicating something that has to do with infectious diseases. So like more like withdrawn themselves from any political or a certain political or economic action from the rest of the world. And this is just an example of like a word that existed before, but now is part of our communication. Another one is infodemic. So infodemic is a, is a blend of words, information and epidemic, and usually refer to the rapid uh, spread of uh, accurate and non-accurate information. And uh, it, it was coined back in 2003 when a SARS uh, uh, epidemic happened. But now is, uh, yeah, we, we have been using to describe the proliferation of news around coronavirus. And I mean, there are so many examples, but the last one that I wanted to, uh, uh, to bring here is social distancing. So social distancing actually dates back 1957, but it was describing an attitude, attitude of people that wanted to be detached from the rest of the community. And it kind of creates some confusion because now we, we use it to indicate uh, uh, social, like physical distancing. So now we, we are like, we use it like to, yeah, is um, to avoid like, so physical distancing to avoid the uh, like to, uh, infection. But uh, I want you to keep in mind this example because uh, like the meaning change and we, although we still use the same fr phrase, social distancing, we mean something different, but it's not really fully expressing uh, 
what we, we, we wanted to indicate. And in fact, if I'm not mistaken, at some point, WHO was trying to change social distancing into physical distancing, but it was too late. It was already out in the social media and the news. And again, there are other, other words uh, here. I just like list some example and we can discuss uh, uh, later on. So I don't want to take too much time, but uh, like shelter in place, for example, was, uh, was used uh, um, in, to indicate a place of safety in American English in events of an atom, uh, atomic or terroristic attack. Uh, album bump, like he dates back in, uh, in the eighties and it was the sports language. Uh, uh, working from home is like 1995, but like now is like it's what we all are doing. Like was not really used before. And same for personal protective equipment. The old phrase dates from uh, 1934. So this is just to show that like we don't just integrate new words, but also we re we reform the meaning of uh, words that uh, were already out there. Another good example in this regard is. Uh, wet market. This is definitely a term that has gained new significance during the pandemic. It was added uh, in the Oxford English Dictionary in, in 2016, but it was, it was first appeared in the English vocabulary in 1978. However, it's more like a term part of the Southeast Asian vocabulary, and this is what it means, like a wet market is a marketplace selling fresh meat, fish produce. However, since the identification of a Huan market as a ground zero for the coronavirus outbreak, the wet market has become a hot topic and conflated with illegal wildlife markets in the popular press and has become subject of sometimes unfair criticism, especially from people outside Asia. And yeah, and here I just added like, uh, like the definition has not been updated yet. I'm curious if... Uh, like the Oxford English Dictionary will, will add uh, the current meaning of, uh, of wet market or like the reference to, to the pandemic. Something else that I wanted to briefly touch upon is, uh, is protests because of course, uh, 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 like why COVID-19 has been one of the defining features of 2020 so far. The other major topic in the news has been the Black Lives Matters and uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and the protests following uh, uh, the killing of George Floyd back in May, as well as those protests resisting stay-home orders. And I want to show this chart here from the uh, Oxford English Dictionary blog. And you can see how words as brutality, anti-racism, racism, in June, they are like they are at the top of the list even before above COVID. So uh, I think it's important to recognize that not only words uh, describing the COVID-19 pandemic uh, have shaped our current language, but also those referring to the Protestant systematic racism uh, have like influenced the language of the, pan the pandemic as well. And uh, another aspect that I wanted to talk about uh, is uh, how many terms, uh, specific terms and scientific, scientific terms enter in the, public, uh, in the public discourse. And uh, yeah, I found this, uh, this, I don't know, I thought it was a fun quote here from the, edit, like the senior editor of like dictionary that says, zoonosis is a word, but if you once played in Scrabble, we're some kind of a genius and now, like because of COVID, uh, we more or less we all heard of this uh, of this word, and uh, yeah, and he like as the we can say that we have so there are so many technical words that have been uh, introduced in our in our vocabulary. Uh, I put together and I can share with you at the end of the presentation a list of. Uh, of words like even Kawasaki disease or are not or uh, yeah I, I mentioned before PPE but if you were not in the field if it was not part of your expertise we were not really familiar with but if you now read any newspaper like you read any news you look at social medias we are dealing with more uh, with uh, with more like uh, scientific and medical terms so I will say like, yeah, as scientists and medical professionals continue to expand our knowledge of the effects of COVID-19, uh, 
new uh, yeah new new terms will emerge and specialist language will continue to be adapted to communicate this knowledge to the public and i wanted to add such because he was part of the goal of our initiative was to clarify these terms that we did not find before in uh, in the news and in social media etc so the second part of my talk is about yeah where the name is COVID-19 uh, and uh, yeah and the name of the virus come from. So first, like the word the noun coronavirus was added in 2008 in the Oxford English Dictionary in April 2008, but it was coined like the first time it was found was in an article in Nature and I highlight here the quote in 1968. Uh, and it says, in the opinion of eight virologists, these viruses are members of a previously unrecognized group of people, of group uh, which they suggest should be called the coronaviruses. To recall the characteristic appearance, uh, specifically recalling the solar corona, by which these viruses are identified in the electron uh, microscope. And the COVID-19 noun has been uh, in, uh, added uh, to the Oxford English Dictionary just like this past June, in June 2020. I mean, it was coined like this year, so it's just been recently added. And I want to read with you the definition. So it says it's an acute disease. So COVID-19, of course, like is the name of a disease caused by a coronavirus, which is characterized mainly by fever and cough and is capable of progressive to pneumonia, respiratory, renal failure, etc. But also this has been added and has been modified. Also the coronavirus that causes the disease. And we'll go back to this point uh, as soon as we talk about the name of the virus. So COVID-19 name uh, um, was like, was announced as the official name of the disease. But in public discourse uh, has been used also to indicate the virus. And there is a reason because of that. Uh, so in, uh, he was back in February, 11 February uh, um, 2020, that the, the, the name of the virus was announced. Uh, viruses are named by the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses. And in February, uh, this committee announced severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 as the name of the new virus because the virus is genetically related to the coronavirus responsible for SARS outbreak back in 2003 but still while related uh, the two viruses are different that's the two and uh, viruses are usually named based on their genetic structure and this is done because they wanted to facilitate the development of diagnostic, diagnostic tests vaccine and medicine yeah. Same day, it was also announced by WHO, who is responsible for the name of the disease, the name of the COVID-19 disease. And coronavirus disease stands for CO stands for corona, but VI stands for virus, D for disease, and 19, of course, is referring to uh, the year when the outbreak was first identified. And I was, before I touch this, I was mentioning that in the, if you, in the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, COVID-19 is the disease first, but also has been added that you can use COVID-19 virus in the public discourse. So from a risk communication perspective, uh, using the name SARS could uh, have uh, unintended consequences uh, in terms of creating unnecessary fear for some population. For example, those who experienced uh, SARS in 2003. So for this reason and others, uh, like he, uh, WHO decided to begin to refer to the virus as the virus responsible for COVID-19 or the COVID-19 virus when communicating with the public. That doesn't mean that it's going to substitute the official name, but it's okay. It was quite a debate at the beginning, and I noticed, especially among virologists, uh, that they were wondering, like, they, they were noticing the, the, this confusion, especially like in newspaper, in the news, in social media. And that's when WHO decided to make this clarification, again, without substituting the official name. And uh, 
And here, like, I would like to address this, uh, this question I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Like, do you think that COVID-19 language is in English? So I added this free example in the language that I'm mostly familiar with, but it, there was a, quite a confusion when, uh, um, I have example in school, for example, when they were trying, like teachers were trying to explain the word COVID-19. And uh, in French, it, it could work, or in Italian, it could work like the very first part of this acronym, CO is Corona, this stands for virus, but what about D? I mean, many students were asking, what is D stands for? Uh, for? Because in Italian or in French, the, the word disease, uh, the English disease is malattia, so it starts with an M. And same for the French, or like I add Spanish. And uh, this is just to become aware, uh, there is no paper that claim that the language of, of science, if we wanted to think broader, is English. But, uh, and here, like the, the name has been decided by a committee, but the, way, the language that we are using is English and maybe becoming more aware of this, uh, it doesn't have any positive or negative value, but the awareness that the language that we use uh, in science uh, is, uh, is English, uh, it could uh, bring the, like, um, we could be proactive, for example, like in education. So it should be like, a, um, we should think more about it and become more aware in, uh, in regard to this aspect. And now I will move to the first part of, uh, of, my, of my talk. And uh, I wanted to, to show you like what we have been doing since, uh, it's actually seven, exactly seven months ago, because we started this initiative uh, back in uh, February 24. And we decided to uh, choose uh, the most uh, used uh, words uh, in the COVID narrative. Uh, and uh, we wanted to provide uh, an etymology together with a simple definition. Because like in order for like, our goal was to give people a tool uh, to navigate through a terminology that, uh, again, if you are not an expert, you are not familiar with. Uh, and uh, we tweeted for until the beginning of, uh, of July. We tweeted five days a week, uh, different words, and that's what we did. Like we provide the etymology, we provide the definition, and uh, we put together a nice vocabulary that can describe the, the, the pandemic. And uh, yeah, for the sake of time, I just decided to, among the etymology that, uh, that we study and we wrote about, uh, I chose three and for the sake of time, but yeah, if you, if you are interested, uh, please contact me and uh, we can talk further. But uh, yeah, even the word pandemic is such an interesting etymology. Uh, he, the word comes from uh, an ancient Greek adjective, pandemos, uh, is a compound adjective. In fact, it's formed by the word pan, which means all, and the other word is demos, which means people. And what it means is like, of, of of the old people, belonging to the old people, public, vulgar. Uh, here I added like the, the easier definition. However, there is not like a, a unique definition of, of pandemic and it's quite complicated. But going back to the etymology, beyond the medical, uh, uh, the, the medical meaning that this word has, uh, I thought it is interesting uh, how this term was used uh, in certain language, definitely I know in Italian and I think in, in, uh, in Spanish too. The word pandemic and pandemia uh, was used as a, a gentle word for prostitute. And that's why like back in, uh, um, in uh, there is a text uh, written by, by the, the, the Greek philosopher Plato, the Apology, and we are talking about uh, like uh, the end of the fifth century, beginning of the fourth century BC, where we find this adjective as an attribute of love, pandemos eros, and it was used to distinguish uh, the vulgar love uh, 
from the more spiritual love in Greek is Uranios. But it's interesting the association. Like now, pandemic, uh, we is a, yeah is an attribute that we can use metaphorically in other contexts. But especially nowadays, we associate it with uh, with an health issues. But uh, yeah, but that's uh, especially like the the development of a pandemia as an euphemism of prostitute came from this uh, Platonic text. The second, uh, uh, the second etymology that I, I always thought very interesting is the, is the word virus. So virus comes from Latin virus, uh, which means venom, and uh, yeah, slimy liquid poison. Uh, virus, the, the, the Latin word virus uh, shares a very ancient uh, root. Uh, in fact, we can compare it to ancient Greek, Yos, and the Sanskrit. He has a Indo-European root, and uh, for non-expert, it's just to show that this word is like, he has a very, very old origin. And uh, the earlier medical sense uh, in, in, that was, this word was used for uh, was a substance producing the body as a result of a, of a disease, especially one capable of infecting others. And the very last one is, uh, is quarantine. So quarantine comes from the Italian, actually from the dialect of Venice. So you have Italian here. But, uh, yeah, and uh, the, the, so it comes from the dialect of Venice, quarantina. I said Italian to simplify. And uh, the origin is actually the Latin uh, number quadraginta, which means 40. Uh, the number 40 has, a, has kind of a, like a sacred meaning. In fact, we find it many times in the Bible or according to, I, I was thinking like the, the, the church, uh, the Greek church fathers, uh, that was the length of time to uh, be purified spiritually. So, of course, nowadays we use quarantine not to indicate that you need to isolate yourself for 40 days. Of course, it depends on the infectious disease that we are dealing with. And now it seems like 14 days. But it's interesting that, uh, yeah, we are using uh, this word that literally means 40. But, uh, yeah, yeah he, he, nowadays, like, the, he's, he's more, he's, he's broader the meaning in, in which we use it. And here I just, like, added the difference between... Uh, isolation and, uh, and quarantine uh, as we, we define nowadays. Uh. And uh, yeah, and, and, uh, and I then collected, so I was mentioning before, we, we decided to, to define and tweet uh, uh, from uh, February 24, and then we discontinue at the end of July, and uh, we are planning to restart one word a week uh, uh, in October. But imagine like we for this set, like for mostly five months, we have been tweeting, tweeting 20, at least 20 words a, a month. So we have, we have a nice collection. And at some point we decided to, we, we decided to pair uh, the, the word with uh, an image. And so like our initiative was then completed by uh, the contagious images and it just selected some you can find them all in our Twitter account, and I will give you all the references at the end. But uh, one was flattened the curve, and I added so our initiative was in Italian too, so I kept both. But uh, in our like one our Twitter account, you have the, the English definition. This was the very first one, like one of the first one swabs when it was paired up with the contagious words, and then we had immunity. And of course, like in, uh, in the Twitter, you have then the etymology and the definition, but uh, I thought I, I overwhelmed you enough with the etymology. So seriological testing, uh, contact tracing, uh, incubation, uh, and yeah, so these are just some of them. And uh, yeah, and I would like to, uh, like before conclusion, like I would like to initiate discussion uh, addressing this uh, this question. But I, I've been thinking a lot about it, and uh, I I yeah I would like to have your your thoughts and your your suggestions. So the very first one, and uh, that I I've been curious, especially teaching uh, um, like some some texts that like uh, like to see this that talk about like the the 
the plague of Athens. So I was thinking how similar is the narrative of uh, pandemic uh, in the past. And again, I was reading like to see the, this, uh, the plague of Athens dates back 5th century BC. And then I was reading Boccaccio, so we are talking about 14th century. And or even the narrative of like the, the uh, Spanish flu in 1918. If you compare the literature of these pandemics to how we describe the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, there are a lot of similarities. And I was wondering, is, uh, is still uh, um, correct to use, do we need a new language? Our reality is so different. So the language that we have uh, is enough to describe uh, the experience uh, that we are, we are having nowadays. So my, my question was like, if we, if we wanted to talk about current like like COVID pandemic or future outbreaks, shall we look for a new language? And uh, yeah, and one that we create by actively understanding the words that we already use. And then what are your contagious words? So with, uh, with our students, something that we did in the summer and I'm still doing in the class, uh, in, in the, in the class in, like during the fall is I've been asking them to, uh, choose five contagious words per week uh, that could reflect their own experience. And it's very fascinating because beyond what we read in the news, each one of us uh, translate into words uh, the individual experience. And uh, so it's something very fascinating and uh, yeah, I encourage you to do the same. And uh, another question that I would like to address is, are we all responsible for the reality that we build through our written and spoken words. So what I meant is I started this talk by saying uh, a great social change brings a linguistic change. But can we say the reverse? Because I feel so and I, I would like to hear from you about it. Uh, and here, yeah, these are some, uh, some of the, the, the I, in my in my opinion, the best source that I use uh, in uh, like in tracking the development of the language of uh, COVID uh, language, I, I can provide you. I, I I I have more sources, so if you are interested, please reach out. Uh, the very first one, COVID nineteen language app, is by the Oxford Languages, and especially the very first project. If we have the time, I can show you like a couple of slides. COVID nineteen multilingual project. I think it's something that they started uh, from the very beginning, but has been just published. And what they did, uh, they translate into different languages the most common uh, um, pandemic words. And it's interesting to and you understand then the confusion. And again, like if we have time and you are interested, I can show it to you. Another good uh, source, so the COVID-19 like, uh, language hub, the Oxford languages, uh, uh, is by the Oxford English, uh, is, uh, is being done by the Oxford uh, English Dictionary uh, uh, team and the lexicographers. They have been writing uh, four blog posts that have been very interesting and they kind of influence the research of other of a um, yeah, other institution. Another good uh, uh, source is the Merriam Webster, especially for new words, for neologism. And also another, like, yeah, I've been also checking the Cam Cambridge Reflections COVID 19. And again, if you are interested, uh, I can. Uh, I can provide you all the sources. And I don't know if you noticed, but I've been using COVID-19, sometimes all caps, and sometimes like here in the title, so it's just like the first uh, uh, capital letter and then uh, in such a way. So it seems that in, in uh, British English, that's the preference. The all caps, COVID-19, it was, uh, at, at the beginning in American English, it was, uh, use both so like he was inter interchangeable like there's small, small caps COVID-19 and then all caps but now it seems that in American English that's what is preference um yeah I'm here so I don't know like yeah we have enough time so we can uh, I I have more slides but I I would rather like see if you have any question and uh we can start from there. And, and thank you so much. So I wanted to thank you, uh, Dr. Kappa, for, uh, for giving me like the possibility to investigate from the very beginning about these aspects that I love. And uh, of course, like thank you, Constance and the one-up team. 
And last but not least, uh, I want to thank you, like my sister, but at some point, like she was, uh, she collaborated with us and uh, she was uh, the, the artist for the contagious images. So I don't know if I should uh, stop. Um, Constanza, I don't know if you, we wanted to open so, um, for some question or discussion. Um, yeah, uh, so and thank you so much. First of all, that was. Uh, Oh, great and really really interesting um, now uh, as I said before you could either write your questions down on the chat um, if that's what you prefer otherwise I can go ahead and unmute you just let me know in the chat and you can ask a question uh, by voice so yeah now it's open for discussion and questions maybe I should like stop sharing and I can go back. Okay, so I have a question, um, which is the following. As you know, um, our center has, act, has been active in uh, defining this emergence of panzootic. Now, mm. uh, I, can you please, because panzootic, I, I bumped into um, something I was reading the other day, and the meaning that was attributed to the word panzootic mm -hmm. was not the meaning that I had attributed to it. So, okay, so go ahead and tell, and can you, can you oh. tell us what, what do you think panzootic means? So literally, and I'm not the only Greekist here, so I can ask help from the other classicists, but panzootic means the all animals. But zoona technically could indicate also like men. So in your article, you were like, that's what you were claiming, like that, that uh, uh, you was transmitting from, uh, not only from animal to humans, but also from uh, humans to animal. Am I correct? Okay, so the point I was trying to make in that article is, of course, the backwards and forwards transmission of the virus, which is, of course, possible. But I was actually making another point, that we have never had to manage an infection which is so widespread in people, because it's a pandemic, but also, also risks becoming widespread in animals. And my point is that I believe that because human beings belong to the animal kingdom, the word panzootic includes human beings. Okay, let me share, let me share with you, because that's the reference that I and I remember before you published the article, this is what I referred to back then, when we actually had panzo. Yeah, but there was, so in there, several kinds of animal, mm -mm. but human beings are animals. From so a taxonomic I, point of view, who human beings are animals. So where do you think that it was not defined in the, in the correct way? Also, my, the, the question is, uh, a pandemic is a disease which infects all human beings. Mm -hmm. um, a disease which infects uh, all human beings and animals should be called a panzootic. Yeah, That's what I'm saying. So panzootic should not only mm -hmm. refer to what is happening in animals. I don't know if anybody has any thoughts no, about it. I agree. I'm sure, that, I'm sure that Sinda, in fact, has something to add. No, and uh, I agree. And actually, like, you are uh, addressing the question that I ask. Because pandemic was the common word where before we were referring to uh, a big epi an epidemic that happens in many different regions. But now that we can track differently and we, we understand differently the dynamics uh, among animals as included, uh, maybe we should think about a different word and use, uh, we could have used panzootic from the very beginning. 
Well, I not really, because we did not know. Okay, so the, the, key, the key is pan, right? So yes. at the beginning, we did not know, and we still don't know if it will become widespread in animals. Our impression and our deductions uh, and let's say the reasoning that we are uh, following is that this disease might um, easily, or well, is already spilling over in animals and might actually become endemic in certain animal populations. And basically certain animal populations can become the gateway to making this infection endemic in many animal populations. And some of these species that we think could be the connecting species are actually mustelids. So um, in the fa in what minks and that type of animal. But the point I was going to make is that I don't think that the humans, the human dog, the people who nice. call this a pandemic, um, understand that this could become a panzotic and therefore the complexity of the measures which we need to be put in place is much greater. And I'm sure that Sinda, who's worked with canine flu, knows exactly what I'm talking about, although that canine flu did not really go spill over into people. Here we're talking about a virus that co could go backwards and forwards. So. I'll leave, uh, I'll let Linda, um, Cinda wants to comment, but I made this point exactly because this is why words are so important. And so, um, yeah, I, this is, this is no, why we, we need to yeah. really understand what words we mean and maybe propose changes to what words mean in the, in the, in, let's say, in, in the general consensus. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this course. And just like to complicate it more, if you think about, we don't even have a, a like a, a definition of pandemic. Like I thought, like when we started, like I think that was the first word that we tweeted at. And I remember, for me it was like, I checked like into the Oxford English Dictionary and then when I consult with the rest of the team, uh, we all disagree because there are features that can help us to recognize what a pandemic is. Uh, and I think uh, there was an article from Dr. Fauci, like I think it was 2011, that was kind of listing all this feature, but a unique uh, definition he actually, yeah, he lacks. So it's already complicated enough that we don't have a clear definition of what a pandemic is. Uh, and then uh, maybe this is, is not even a pandemic. So just to make things even more complicated now. I, I agree with both of you. Um, and I, I've put some thoughts in the chat, typed them into the chat while uh, Dr. Caffio was speaking. But technically, you know, first of all, haven't most of the pandemics in the history books all the way up through today actually been panzoatics? And the fact that it started animal, went to people, went back into animals, and not maybe not every species of animal, but there was spillover to some species. So, I mean, if you go back to the Great Plague in the 1300s, it was rats mm -hmm. to people. Um, and then I think there was, and then there's, you know, you can't have spillover back to others. So all the influenza, uh, pandemics, um, animal people back into some animals. Uh, so it's so technically speaking, the use of the terms epizootic hmm. and panzootic are correct, but you know, very few scientists know the difference between panzootic and pandemic, and so it becomes a those terms become very awkward to use outside of a very, very small scientific circle. Um, whereas it, they, they won't even fit into our current language for COVID. They don't fit into it. I mean, I think people understand the term pandemic right now and 
and yes, uh, people around the world have become armchair epidemiologists and are learning some of the uh, uh, epidemiology terms like isolation, quarantine, pandemic. But how are we ever going to really use the correct terms exactly, yeah. and be understood? That, you know, I, I personally find it very awkward in manuscripts or giving presentations to use the term epizootic. Sometimes, uh, I mean, uh, that's my that's my opinion. Uh, the most important thing is clarity. So if you think that you are more communicative, uh, uh, I mean, I, you, um, you need to understand the context. So definitely if you're talking up with your expert, yeah, like with people of the same expertise, I think you need to be specific. Uh, but then in the public discourse, if we have a history of pandemic, uh, maybe it's more communicative than uh, panzootic, or we need to prepare the, the ground to introduce a new term. So, so if I may, this is a problem of scientific literacy because mm -hmm. uh, Saras mentioned that the word zoonotic uh, was a word that could award you a lot of points of scrabble, but actually now everybody knows what a zoonotic disease is. So I think that, yeah. first of all, before we communicate to others, we should have clear in our minds uh, what we want to communicate. And um, I think that the word panzootic, which is not used at all, not very well understood, should be defined uh, mm -hmm. and could be defined once and for all to define a disease which involves multiple species of animals, which include humans. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah. No, thank you. And I think I see some question here. Let me see. Um, yes, there is a question from Melos. Uh, yeah. Would you like me to read it out? Yeah, I can see it too. I wanted to ask whether you're, you've noticed a larger vocabulary related to Corona in some languages as compared to others. Rona seems like got traction among young English speaking people in Twitter. I haven't heard in the yeah, in Albanian, Albanian speaking circle, for example. I also mentioned pandemic having a, yeah, like it's a, so I've been, I'm, honestly, I've been tracking, uh, I've been uh, analyzing or reading more about the English language. Then uh, even like many Italian, like I was, uh, I've been following like new words and slang around uh, COVID, but I don't even know what they, what they use in Italian. So I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know if there is a larger vocabulary here related to Corona. I'm not, I don't know. That would be very interesting, actually. Yeah, Rona, yes, is in the... Uh, yeah, Pro Professor Pagan said is a, is a clip that existed before the pandemic in reference to the Mexican via. Yes, definitely. I read about this. But if I understood correctly, Melos, your question, if I know if uh, is more prominent here, the neologism in terms of Corona or slangs, uh, I don't know how to answer, but that would be very interesting to check. And uh, again, like if we have time, I... The, what the Oxford uh, languages start doing is just to compare the main words. I'm sure that they will come up with something similar, like in relation to slangs. And then, uh, um, yeah, you also mentioned pandemic having other connotation in Latin languages, uh, both affecting this in the response or discussion in any way. Uh, no, like if, uh, I, I think like even the word like pandemia, uh, I'm, I'm positive in Italian. I think I read it when I was reading like the, the, the Italian dictionary. I read it in, uh, in Spanish too, but it's not used anymore. And I didn't know, like until I actually was uh, studying the etymology of pandemic, I didn't know that it was an euphemism for prostitute because the latest that it was used was like 1920s. So I don't, I don't think that influenced the the meaning of pandemic nowadays. We also forget that it's actually like just an adjective and means uh, like the old people, so. And uh, yeah, and then when will the disease be considered a pandemic versus being considered panzootic? Uh, so Viviana, I don't know if we answered already your question or 
we will need more clarification. Yeah, yeah thank you. And uh, let me see if, uh, let me just share with you. So, I mean, beyond these, uh, Oh, no, I don't have it here. I forgot. So what I, I actually save is, um, yeah, I didn't, uh, I actually canceled not to make it too long, but I save some, uh, uh, yes, I, I save some example from like how the Oxford English Dictionary uh, translate, uh, even lockdown, you also realize, like in Italian, lockdown is lockdown. And uh, or like even uh, working from home, uh, like the acronym is used in the Italian language too, but then you 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 look into uh, into Spanish and into French. We actually translated uh, in the corresponding language, so you also see how some languages as Italian are welcome more foreignism, like like uh, words that they do not belong to the Italian language. Uh, so, for example, English words, while Spanish and French are usually more reluctant. So, like even like looking at this comparison in the translation, you also understand the, the tendency of the languages. Uh, and, uh, and like, if you are interested, please uh, let me share again my contact. So feel free to, to contact me and I can, uh, yeah, I can give you all the sources that you like. I don't know if there are other questions or... Oh, yes, we have another question from Victoria. Um, no, that's really interesting. <laughs> Let me <laughs> stop sharing so I can see it too. Um, is that, have you come across a word to describe the burning sensation experienced during the COVID yeah. test? Have you? I know, like, I know, I did not, uh, but I'm sure that there is a, uh, this classic special, <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, we, we surely do, and, uh, yeah, no, I, I did not, but, uh, I know that, but I know that UF has just changed, right? It is not swab anymore, but it's uh, so no, no painful experience anymore. But no, I did not. I'm sure there is. Uh, and something that I really wanted to, I would like much more, yeah, to discuss language in general. Okay, yeah, and please make a, yeah, like please don't hesitate to contact me. And really something that uh, I, I keep asking myself is, again, like the, the way I start is the social change, therefore language change. But I truly believe the opposite. So it's, it's the same like, uh, yeah, it's the same uh, during COVID. Uh, like the way we talk also, uh, look for example, social distancing. If uh, maybe if we were using physical distancing from the very beginning, uh, we would have avoid a certain situation of like, big isolation and people have been men like mentally struggling about it. So we definitely, uh, I told my students many times, like it's not just the language that describes reality, but uh, also like we shape reality from, uh, we create reality out of our languages. Uh, so, no vaccine. No. Yeah, probably yes, more interesting twists on words about vaccine. I think so. And uh, I wanted to add the, the sources because both are the official one. And there is such a big debate uh, if like among lexicographers, if they wanted to turn a word uh, into, uh, they wanted to add it in the dictionary. So if you just Google uh, new COVID words, you can find so many every day, but that doesn't mean that they then become part of our vocabulary. Something else, uh, uh, yeah, just a flow early on, it's true. Yeah, language, thank you, Melos, for bringing this. So Melos says, language shaping really responds like powerful people referring to just as a flow. It's true, like we need to be careful because then, again, like the language uh, is, 
he's our tool to describe the reality, but sometimes it's the, the vice versa. So that's why we need to use it responsibly. Yeah, and I don't think we have enough time, but something else, I, I just, I focus on the English language, but our discussion around like COVID and maybe these are more, more, uh, more nerdy and, and I, lo I love languages, but it was about even like this, something that we, we don't think about in English language, but it was a problem uh, in French. Uh, and uh, I was reading in French and in Italian, like is COVID uh, feminine or, or uh, masculine? As a disease in Italian is feminine, but the article that we used to refer was actually masculine. So there was created uh, some discussion around this linguistic uh, confusion uh, and that did not happen in English. Uh. Yeah. Okay, I think, uh, and again, like don't, uh, don't hesitate to contact me, even if you want to collaborate. This is something, uh, we, we started this initiative, now uh, we have all these words from students and uh, yeah, it will be, if you have uh, any, if you wanted to collaborate, please reach out. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you all for connecting. Thank you.